right, thank you everybody for being here today. Today I'm going to talk about a pot topic that's actually quite popular, the Titanic. But I'm going to actually approach it from a slightly different direction. There's a lot out there on the sinking and the collision and all of the stuff that's pretty much in movies, books, magazines. But a lot of what's out there actually doesn't talk about how the Titanic got into that situation or even much about its history being built and leading up to it. Uh, so I'm going to give a kind of different talk. I'm actually going to talk more about the Titanic as a tragic liner, but from an untold story standpoint. Hopefully by the end you'll learn some new things, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, it'll be interesting. First of all, this ship right here is the reason the Titanic exists. This is the Lusitania. It's actually part of the Canard Line, which was not the White Star Line. And pretty much the Canard Line and the White Star Line were in competition with each other for crossing the Atlantic and getting immigrants mostly to North America as well as businessmen and other people back to Europe and doing the trade. Back in the day, of course, there were no commercial airlines. This was the way you got across the Atlantic. This is how you traveled between the Americas and between uh, Europe. The Canard Line was actually far, far ahead of the White Star Line. Uh, and predominantly because the Lusitania and its sister ship, the Mauritania, both built around 1907. And uh, as you can see here, it's a sleek, fast ship. At the time, it was known for its speed, and it was also the largest at the time. 787 foot long, 44,000 tons, and it could cruise at 25 knots and even peak 26 knots. It was fast, and you could get across the Atlantic very quickly, which time is money. And certainly for businessmen, as well as immigrants, uh, getting across the treacherous North Atlantic certainly was of an interest. I might point out, by the way, that the Lusitania that you see here was uh, tragically torpedoed and sunk um, right at the beginning of World War I in 1915 and is actually the reason why the United States entered War I, or one of the reasons, I should say. So the White Star Line knew they needed to compete with this, and what they decided to do was take a different tact. So what they proposed was to build a new line of ships that couldn't compete with speed. Speed wasn't actually what they were going to go for. Instead, what they were going to go for was size and also luxury. So this is a model. This is what they proposed. This was going to be the Olympic and Titanic ships that they were going to build. Uh, it's actually called the Olympic class, by the way. Uh, a lot of people think that the Titanic was the lead ship of the class. It was the only one. In fact, it was the Olympic that was really the star of the show. Uh, it was the Olympic class, and she was the one that would ultimately be built, built first. Uh, one and a half times larger than the Lusitania or the Mauritania, and uh, running at around 52,000 tons. Not as fast, though. You see it's only 21, 23 knots. And the purpose of that was they weren't going to get you there quite as quick. You're going to take a little bit longer, but you were really going to enjoy the ride. The maximum speed was down, but it was bigger, and it was much more luxurious. And so White Star hoped that actually take over and win the North Atlantic trade competition by taking this tact instead. So let's talk a little bit about the design of the ships. Most people, of course, have talked about some of the aspects of it, but there's some very curious aspects of the Titanic and the Olympic that, that actually don't get mentioned a whole lot. So of course, first of all, 29 boilers, big, a lot, a lot of boilers, um, and two triple expansion engines, as well as a secondary turbine that the steam would expand into the two outside prop shafts out of the three would be turned by the triple expansion engines. Their steam exhaust would go into a turbine and that would turn the center propeller. And between these uh, three propellers, that kept this massive ship moving. And the design was approved in 1908, uh, as you kind of see it here. And I apologize for the not necessarily having a very clear schematic, but this is actually what they showed the public. And I think it's kind of interesting to see what the public saw. A couple of things, of course, and almost everybody's aware of this with the Titanic, is the watertight compartments. There were 16 in total. One of the safety features of the ship, not only was it going to be luxurious, it was going to be very safe. And there you can see those little walls there going up. I will note that they do not go all the way up. Notice they only stop about two thirds of the way up. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Another thing that people don't talk about a whole lot, but actually was a very innovative fe safety feature of the Titanic, was the double-hulled bottom. Uh, it wasn't the entire hull, it was just the bottom of the ship, but they thought if you ran aground or ran into anything, the double hull would protect you. Uh, the first part might flood, but it certainly wasn't gonna flood the main part of the ship. Uh, again, another safety feature that they, they touted and things like that. 
And it was this sort of design that they thought would actually uh, prove to be the best, safest way to get across the North Atlantic. Now, one thing that, uh, and then of course I should say with the safety features, Shipbuilding Magazine ultimately called this design practically unsinkable. Nobody actually called the Titanic sinkable, uh, but it was practically unsinkable. I guess close enough, we're splitting hairs here. In any case, one of the features that people don't notice, but if you kind of look closely at the schematic, you notice it, is that fourth smokestack is actually a dummy. You notice it's not connected to any of the flues of those 29 boilers. The reason for that was purely aesthetics. Uh, the uh, canard line ships all had four smokestacks and they weren't gonna be outdone. They weren't as fast, but hey, you've gotta have four smokestacks too, just to keep up with the competition. So in the end, uh, they added a four smokestack just to make it look good. And you'll notice this in photographs later, that that fourth smokestack there does absolutely nothing. All right, so when they decided to go ahead and get the design approved and they were going to build these two ships, uh, they went to their standard shipbuilder, Harlan and Wolf uh, in Ireland. And uh, this is the Queen's Island Yard that you see here in the, uh, the lithograph. It was reorganized, the whole shipyard was pretty much reorganized in 1907 and 1908 for the construction of these two ships. And like I said, this is White Star's main shipbuilding place. All of their ships, in fact, except for one, was actually built right here at Harlan and Wolf. And the Titanic and the Olympic were built right there. Uh, you can kind of see it on the little left-hand side. And that part that sticks out is actually the island, the Queen's Island. Uh, it's really, of course, now not really an island, but they called it that. Kind of looking overhead at the entire shipyard, uh, this is kind of a schematic of all the shops that were needed. They had shops that did metal, they did wood, all of the uh, equipment that they would need, uh, boilers, everything was pretty much made right here or brought in and assembled and installed in, in the shipyard. Uh, a very self-contained community to build ships like this. Of course, now the Olympic was actually the top line ship of the class. And so she was built right there in slip number two, you can see it. And right next to her in slip number three is the Titanic. Uh, they uh, were built side by side, almost simultaneously, starting on the Olympic first, of course, and going on to the Titanic second. And this is what they look like under construction. Uh, they were built on land, of course. They uh, started the construction in 1908 on the Olympic, and the next year, in 1909, started a construction on the Titanic. Uh, so the Olympic was always a little bit ahead in its construction. And you'll notice that Olympic is ship number hull 400. That was its official number. Uh, and a Titanic, of course, would make sense to be 401, and you can see her right next to her. Now, one thing that a lot of people think is that the Titanic was the ship. Well, no, actually, Olympic was the ship, and I think nothing summarizes that better than this photograph here. So you see Olympic on the right, and you notice that it doesn't have really the look of what we think of when we say the Titanic. In fact, it's a very bright color. It's probably painted a gray or a white, a nice red uh, uh, bottom on it, and it was launched uh, in October of 1910, and it was actually painted gray because of publicity. Most of the photographs that you see of the Titanic being launched is actually the Olympic being launched, especially if it's gray, because the Olympic was the primary ship. That was actually the one that was gonna succeed, was getting all the publicity, and this was the one that everybody focused on. Uh, the Titanic was kind of an afterthought in the background. It was gonna be the second ship, uh, not quite the first. And so the Olympic actually had a big ceremony. They slid her into the water, broke a bottle on the bow, crowds, bands, dignitaries, the whole bit. It was a big event. Oh, and you can see the Titanic there off to the side. But when the Titanic went in the water, there was none of that. You see her hull is already painted the black color that uh, she, she sailed with. And uh, there was uh, no publicity, very few photographs. This is just one of the few that I've been able to find. And uh, there was no ceremony. There was no christening with a bottle or anything like that. Uh, just slid in the water when she got to the point of completion and then they tie, put her up on the side of the pier and continued fitting her out. You can see there's still quite a bit of work to be done, uh, but the hull was uh, finished and then they could put it in the water and then keep working on the ship. She only launched seven months after the Olympic in 1911, spring of 1911 in May, and work continued. And if there's one reason why I have to, or one ship I have to blame for why the Titanic hit the iceberg, or at least for the whole disaster, this would be the ship right here. This is HMS Hawk. Now the HMS Hawk was an Edgar class cruiser, 
built in 1891, and she happened to collide with the Olympic on September 20th of 1911. The Olympic had already been operating for not quite a year, um, but the two were passing in opposite courses, and suddenly the Hawk just veered to the starboard side and collided with the stern of the Olympic, uh, doing quite a bit of damage to both, actually. And uh, eventually, of course, all the cause of the blame was actually put on the Olympic, even though it was the Hawk that actually did the veering and the colliding. The reason was is that they said that the suction from the Olympic passing was so great, you gotta remember this is the largest vessel in the world, actually drew the Hawk off course and into the ship. And uh, White Star actually did appeal that and they lost their appeal as well. As far as the British uh, Navy and, and uh, the Admiralties were concerned, uh, it was all the Olympic's fault. Now this is what it looked like. Um, you can actually see the Mohawk's bow here seriously damaged, and on the right you can see the damage to the Olympic, uh, a very large gash into the side of the ship where the bow went in. You can even kind of see the shape of the ship. Uh, it's kind of triangular, it matches up very well with the Hawk's bow. And uh, the, the Hawk was so damaged that the bow had to be cut off and a whole new bow put on instead. The Olympic had two watertight compartments flood and more seriously damaged the propeller shaft on the starboard side. That meant that she could no longer operate. And so, back to the shipyard the Olympic went. Now, of course, the Olympic's already in service. It's making money. And you have to remember, the purpose of these two ships is to make money for the company. The Olympic is out right now in service, or was in service, and she's making money for the company. Titanic is still being built, and so she doesn't, she's not going to have really revenue potentials until later on. So, of course, you do the right thing. You, you take parts off of the Titanic or you stop work on the Titanic to be able to get the Olympic back into work, uh, operation as soon as possible. You have people with tickets and they need a ride. So it took two months to repair the Olympic and you can see them side by side. Uh, again, a lot of people think that the Titanic was a one-off, that it was the biggest ship of the world of the day. Actually, the Olympic was uh, equally large, just slightly smaller. We'll get into that in a bit. But for the most part, you have two Titanics sitting right next to each other in this photograph, which I, I think is kind of cool. All of this delayed the maiden voyage of the Titanic by about a month, is what they figure, uh, including the borrowed prop shaft that they had to take off the Titanic to put into the Olympic. All of that, of course, caused the stars to kind of line up for what was about to happen. Uh, but it did happen twice. There really was another incident where actually after the Olympic was put back into service, it threw a propeller. Uh, blade. Um, not as too much serious damage, but she again had to return to the shipyard on March of 1912. Right before the Titanic was actually scheduled, work stopped on the Titanic again in order to get the Olympic back in to service. So instead of a, a launch, uh, Titanic uh, beginning scheduled service in March 20th of that year, uh, her maiden voyage was actually delayed for 20 days. And, and again, I'd like to look at this photograph. Here again, we have two Titanics essentially sitting side by side. Uh, people seem to be, it's an unusual sight, and I would have loved to have seen it back then. These were enormous ships, the biggest of their day, and uh, to see two of them side by side at the same time must have been really pretty impressive. So, eventually, despite all these mishaps by the Olympic, the Titanic was finished. She was ready to start sailing. Of course, she was slightly bigger than the Olympic. So when they say the Titanic was the largest ship in the world, they're not wrong but they're only wrong by, by a few hundred tons. Because they built Titanic second, they decided to take a little more effort, put a little more luxury, make some design tweaks, and the end result was is that the Titanic ended up being 52,310 tons versus the, her sister ship, the Olympic, at 52,067 tons. You can see there isn't much difference there. Technically, the Titanic is the largest, but if you put the two side by side, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. They looked identical. The Titanic was more luxurious. They actually went to more effort, especially with the first class cabins and the specialized cabins for the millionaires of the day. But in the end, there was still uh, one other issue, and that was weather. So one more thing delayed the Titanic sailing. Uh, it was supposed to sail on April 1st, 1912, but it was delayed by a day because of the strong winds. So it didn't leave uh, for Southampton, uh, from Belfast until April 2nd, 1912. And by the way, I'll take a look at this photo. You notice the three front smokestacks are producing smoke. That fourth dummy snack, nothing's happening. 
Again, it's purely for looks. They didn't want to have less stacks than their competitors, so they put that fourth stack on. So let's talk a little bit about the ship. Now, this is what most people focus on, is the first class parlor rooms uh, and the first class accommodations. And, and certainly that was one of the big selling points of the Titanic, especially if you were wealthy. Here's some photographs of the various suites, and they had a wide range of uh, room designs. Everyone was kind of unique and tailored to if it was actually reserved for somebody special, or even if it was just for general passengers. Each room kind of had its own opulence, its own style, and you can see that it's definitely very nice looking. First class luxuries, people will concentrate on that. Some things people aren't aware of, the Titanic had elevators. That was a very big innovation of the day. A lot of buildings didn't have elevators. Uh, they were relatively new, and the Titanic actually had an entire bank of working elevators. Uh, that had a swimming pool in it, swimming baths they called it, squash court, and most interestingly, the Turkish baths. In fact, the Turkish baths are, are, have actually been explored. James Cameron, after making the movie, went back and made another movie about actually exploring inside the Titanic using two little ROVs called Jake and Elwood. One of them actually got into the Turkish baths, and the rust sickles are big on the roof, the uh, light fixtures are hanging down, but the, the tile walls and the, the intricate designs are all still visible today, or at least they were when he was in there. And so, uh, again, a lot of accommodations in the Titanic that a lot of people don't really focus on, but these were big selling points. This was stuff to do while you're at sea waiting to get to North America or Europe, depending on which way you're going. And so that's what most people concentrate on, first class. But what they don't concentrate on so much is the second and third class stuff. And in fact, that was really where White Star was really going to make their money. Yes, the publicity would go with the first class passengers, but it was the second and third class that was really the ones that were going to make money for the ship. Uh, they were the bulk of the passengers, and in the same theme of what White Star was trying to do in its competition with Canard, is it was going to make it more luxurious for these people as well. So here you can see a second class stateroom. It's actually quite comfortable compared to second class staterooms in other ships. Um, you can see that there's a nice lounge, bed, even has a, a wash basin, sink, in the room. That's pretty unusual for that day. Uh, even uh, houses didn't necessarily have their own washroom or, or sink or anything installed with running water. Quite an uh, extravagance for the day. And the whole point was to make this a vacation. While you were on travel, you were going to enjoy it. You were going to have luxuries that you otherwise would not normally have access to. You see some of the second class, the dining room and the smoking room. This would have been equivalent to first class in most other ships. But here in second class, you're now living as a first class passenger uh, for all practical purposes. And that was kind of the selling point. And you got to remember in Edwardian world of, that the Titanic existed in, you did not cross class lines. That was a very big no-no. And this was a legitimate way for you to live the good life while remaining in your class. And that is exactly what the, the White Star Line was going for. And of course, it carried down to the third class accommodations as well. Uh, you can see the stateroom here for third class. Look at that, it still has a wash basin with running water in it as well. I guarantee you most thirst clad passengers had never seen that in their house before. And again, rather relatively simple, but still very nice accommodations in the common room, the dining room, places that they were allowed to be. This is people, of course, that came from poverty. They're usually leaving Europe to go to North America to start a new life. And they're going to have a great send-off. They're going to enjoy their trip across the Atlantic. They're going to enjoy some luxuries they otherwise wouldn't have uh, access to. And in the end, hopefully have a better life in, in, in America. And this was really the bulk of the passengers. And this is really the bulk of the income for White Star. This is really what they're focusing on. So yes, the first class was nice, but the second and third class, while overlooked, are really what the, the selling point was, what the real business model was that White Star was going for. So let's follow the Titanic on its final voyage. Now, most people start with the point that it headed out into the Atlantic, but a lot of things happened before it actually did that. So of course, first it left Belfast on April 2nd, after the wind died down, and it went down to Southampton there, the southern point of uh, uh, Britain. And you, there, it actually spent uh, the next few days, a week or two, loading everything that you need to run a ship. Food, uh, linens, uh, dishes, silverware, 
all the stuff that you need to be able to, to actually run the ship and have passengers. The ship had been fitted out with its equipment and the stuff that it needed up in Belfast, but now it needed the luxury stuff that is kind of the everyday items. And so it went down there, and after about a week, they actually loaded passengers, but they still didn't just sail across the Atlantic at that point. Uh, they actually went across the channel there to Cherbourg, or Cherbourg, and uh, took up passengers there. This was actually their first port of car call, was uh, in France. Um, they did not just head straight for New York. Uh, they took on passengers there, some passengers got off, some goods and mail were exchanged. You've got to remember the ship was also a royal mail ship. And then from there, it still did not leave, go across the Atlantic, it actually went up to County Cork, the southern part of Ireland. And there again, passengers got on and off, mail was exchanged. If you've ever seen photographs taken aboard the ship by an Irish priest, this is where he got off at. Uh, a, a lot of people have probably seen those photographs, but often wondered, how is it that these photographs taken right as the, on the ship's maiden voyage actually survived the sinking? Well, the, the answer is they didn't survive the sinking. He took those photographs going over to Ireland uh, in the first, part, first couple legs of the ship's journey. Uh, if you've seen the movie, by the way, Titanic by James Cameron, he tried to duplicate all of those photographs in his movie. If you've seen those photographs and you watch the movie, Somewhere in there, you will see those photographs actually acted out, like the little kid playing with a top on the deck while his dad watches. Various scenes like that are all in the movie. Uh, Cameron kind of slid those in. He was, to him, it was very important to duplicate those maiden voyage photographs. And of course, when the priest got off, those photographs survived. And that's finally when the Titanic sailed out across the Atlantic. Uh, now, it, from here, the story gets pretty familiar. We all know what happened. Sailed a little faster than it should have at night, uh, through an ice field, hit an iceberg, and sank. That's the, the stuff most people know. Just some of the, the statistics of the sinking. Of course, it struck in the late evening hours of uh, April 14th, around 11.40 p.m. But it did not sink until the next morning, uh, about 2.20 a.m. on April 15th. So it actually hit the iceberg in one day and sank on the next. And uh, I should point out, by the way, Abraham Lincoln was shot on the evening hours of the 14th and died on the early morning hours of the 15th, uh, half a century before that. But nevertheless, it seems to be, everybody talks about the Ides of March. I'd be more worried about the Ides of April. Uh, plus, it's tax day, so everybody's favorite day. In any case, the Titanic took a long time to sink. And I think that's portrayed pretty well in the movies, uh, certainly James Cameron's Titanic, as well as other movies and books and things that have been created about the event. It, it actually took a very long time. It almost took three hours. And there are some uh, actually excellent videos out there that actually start with animation. It's all computer animated. And they run it in real time from just a little before the incident of striking the iceberg. And you know the ship goes for a while. It stops. They uh, muster. You know, they declare an emergency, tell everybody to come on the deck. And, and if you actually watch it in real time, you realize how slow of a disaster this was. This was actually a disaster in slow motion. And nobody believed it was actually really important. Uh, most of the passengers, in fact, really didn't think there was any issue until maybe the last half hour, 45 minutes, when the bow started to dip down significantly and they realized that maybe they should get aboard the lifeboats. Speaking of the lifeboats, of course, there were 1,500 people uh, that perished, roughly. We actually don't know the real number. Uh, the US reported 1,517, but the British actually reported uh, 1,490, a little bit of a discrepancy. You'd think you'd actually know how many people were lost, but there are some uh, issues with the manifest, who was on, who wasn't. And the end result is we end up with some slightly different numbers of how many perished. Uh, you can see that it's about two thirds of the, the people. Between 705 and 711 survived, again, depending on who you believe. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a disaster of, of extremely large magnitude here. I mean, two thirds of the passengers and crew did not make it. There was, of course, 20 lifeboats aboard, which was four more than legally required. They were only required to have 16. And it was from a 1894 law uh, that said any vessel over 10,000 tons had to have this number. It didn't take into account how many passengers there were on at all. And I think this has actually been covered pretty well by all sorts of writings. They didn't have enough lifeboats. Even if every lifeboat was occupied to its complete maximum capacity, 
they still would have only had enough room for about half of the passengers. And so two thirds died, but if they had done everything right, still half would have died. So obviously that was a slight flaw in the law. And I should point out that nobody again thought this was a disaster. In fact, you're at night, you're at midnight, one in the morning, and they tell you you have to get in this lifeboat in the chilly April night and go out to the Atlantic and uh, sit there in a lifeboat. Nobody wanted to do that. In fact, they didn't see any reason to. In fact, a lot of people, the first people to get in lifeboats, were told, no worries, this is just a precaution. You'll be back on board in the morning for breakfast. Well, it didn't turn out that way. That first lifeboat launched with only 12 people out on board out of a total capacity of 40. And that continued for lifeboat after lifeboat for quite some time. And again, it wasn't until the last hour or less that the lifeboat started to be filled to maximum capacity. By then it was obvious there was a problem. It's a slow motion problem, but now it's becoming much, much clearer to people. And so they're rushing now to get on the lifeboats. And of course, a lot of drama with that, pretty well portrayed. I will say that the news media at the time wasn't much better than today in some cases. Um, this is, of course, there's always a rush to publish. First person who publishes gets to sell all their papers. So a lot of them apparently published with absolutely no information and kind of must have made it up. Because here's one headline, the Titanic uh, from the Daily Mirror. You can see that the ship with 2,300 aboard in peril, but fortunately everybody is safe. The uh, suspense ends with a message of relief in the morning and the passengers were taken off and the helpless giants being towed to New York by an Allen liner. Well, I can't imagine that any parts of that that was actually correct. But nevertheless, that was actually the initial reports is that there was no issue. There was, everybody was saved, the, the ship had a problem, but everybody's good and the ship was not even sunk, it was under tow and would be recovered. Well, we all know that didn't exactly work out that way. It turned out to be a, a horrible disaster and in the end result is there was a lot of things about the sinking that affect us even today. And a lot of people that don't even think about the fact that what they do and things that they expect are actually go back to the Titanic. So for instance, everybody of course uh, knows it hit an iceberg. It was after this event that the International Ice Patrol was formed. First it was ships only, later it was airplanes, now it's satellites. They're still doing it today. And you would think there would already have been a rule, but it wasn't. Lower speeds were required through ice fields. Um, back in the day, that wasn't necessary, but after the Titanic, people began to respect ice a lot more. All vessels were required to carry lifeboats for everybody on board. Sounds like common sense, but that 1894 law, no, that wasn't required. After the Titanic, everybody had to uh, have a lifeboat and a life jacket available for them, and safety drills had to be conducted at all passengers and crew. In fact, anybody that's been on a cruise ship today, or even a small day boat, has to go through this, where at least they talk about where the life jackets are, what the emergency procedures are, uh, they might have to do a muster at their, their point where they'll get on their lifeboats. Some of it's virtual now, I understand. But nevertheless, all of this comes out of the Titanic sinking. Uh, it wasn't done before, and afterwards it became required. SOS. Now, everybody knows the Titanic sent an SOS. Uh, they may or may not know that actually this was the first ship in an actual emergency to send an SOS. Before that, it was CQD, was the distress code on Morse code. And they were actually sending CQD initially, and then one of the two telegraph operators said, hey, let's go ahead and send the new SOS code. And so they switched over to that. And of course, they had a radio on board and two operators. Um, most of their time was actually spent getting stock reports and sending buy-sell things for the wealthy passengers. That's why they ran their, had two uh, operators running pretty much 24 hours. But other ships in the area didn't have radios, weren't required. And one ship, the California, did have a radio and an operator, a single operator, who worked his eight-hour shift, turned the set off, and went to bed. And that's exactly what happened right before the Titanic started to broadcast its SOS, or actually its CQD. The, uh, if the California had kept its radio on and had an operator there, they would have heard the SOS and they were the closest ship to them. They would have at least arrived in time to pick up passengers possibly off the ship, but certainly pull everybody from lifeboats and people out of the water. It may have been a very different disaster if only the California had kept its radio on. They called it a Marconi set, by the way, not a radio. But nevertheless, it was a radio. Rules changed after that. After that, every ship had to carry a radio and they had to have it on 24 hours a day 
with somebody listening uh, and auxiliary power supply and other technical details like that suddenly the radio became a very important safety feature uh, we take for granted every ship has a radio multiple radios in many cases uh, not not so before the titanic but very much so after the titanic i should also say that uh, the firing of red rockets so another thing that the california saw was flares their watch actually saw the red rockets being launched from the titanic in the distance at close to the horizon and they said they thought they talked about it and they decided that in fact they were just shooting fireworks off for the entertainment of their passengers they had no idea the disaster was happening uh, again the california could have changed history but didn't they ignored those red flares and sailed along their way the uh if they had different history but afterwards Nobody was ever to fire red rockets again from a ship unless they were actually in distress. Uh, it became internationally interpreted as a sign of distress, but before that, it wasn't. More of a, uh, a ship detail than anything else, but a lot of people, they changed not just radio laws with, with this. Uh, another thing, of course, is that now that the Titanic has sunk, the Olympic is going to have to be modified. Obviously, the safety features were not good enough. And that's exactly what they did. They extended the bulkheads up further. Uh, remember I said they only went up two thirds. That allowed the water to overflow and just serially fill the compartments one after another as the ship got lower in the water. And so after that, they actually extended them all the way to the deck and in fact required any ship with bulkheads to do so. No short bulkheads anymore. That changed after the Titanic at will. And in many cases, double hulls, not just the bottom, but the entire hull. If the Titanic had had a double hull on the sides, again, the disaster might have been very different. Uh, the bottom is great, but you really need it on the sides as well as the bottom. And in fact, if today, that's still a rule. Uh, most ships that carry passengers or like oil tankers are required to have a double hull. That means sides, bottom, everything. Uh, another thing that the Olympic was modified with this, it was also given more lifeboats and of course there's a third ship out there so nobody talks about the gigantic that was actually the planned third ship and in there they even had some publicity things about it but after the titanic disaster nobody wanted to call it the gigantic uh, it sounded way too much like titanic um, in fact they decided that they, the whole size thing may not be a good thing to emphasize given the disaster had happened and so what they did is they eventually did build the third ship but they called it britannic uh, the Britannic was built with all of the extra safety features plus one extra watertight compartment. And you might ask, what happened to these ships? The two were surviving sister ships of the Titanic. Well, the Olympic, the main ship of the class, actually, despite its early initial operational difficulties, went on to sail for another 25 years, survived World War I, before finally being scrapped right before World War II in 1937. The sister ship, uh, Britannic, however, did not do so well. So the Britannic actually hit a mine off of Greece uh, during World War I as operating as a hospital ship. It was empty at the time. It was coming back to take on more patients to take them back to, to the Britain for treatment. It hit a mine and it sank. The irony, oh, and I should point out, the irony is it sank even faster than the Titanic did. It sank in under an hour. Despite the extra safety features, despite the extra compartment, uh, and that's probably most likely due to the fact it had all of these open windows to air out the ship after all of these sick, bloodied passengers, or patients, I should say. And of course, as soon as the ship got even a little low in the water, water started coming in through all those open portholes. They couldn't possibly close them in time. And so the irony is that despite all the safety features, another Titanic sank during World War I in Greece, and it sank in, in a third of the time, uh, which is kind of ironic. Another thing that people aren't really aware about the Titanic is that it was actually predicted. There was a book, interestingly written in 1898, so we're actually talking 14 years before the incident. It was called The Titan, Futility, The Wreck of the Titan. And the book was about a luxurious ocean liner that was the largest in the world, considered practically unsinkable, and it struck an iceberg in the North Atlantic on its maiden voyage and sank with great loss of life due to insufficient lifeboats. Sounds really familiar, doesn't it? And yet, this was a novel, a complete work of fiction, written in 1898. So I have here, actually, you can see the cover of the novel. Um, and let's compare some of the, the 
details between it and the actual Titanic disaster. So, of course, nationality in the novel was British. Here you can see its length and, and propellers and all that stuff. Let's go through and see how the Titanic compares. Well, of course, the Titanic certainly was British. That makes sense. Uh, the length, uh, pretty similar. Actually, the Titanic is a little bigger, uh, about uh, 80 foot longer. And it was a little bigger in tonnage. Uh, and he predicted a tonnage of 45,000, when in fact about 66,000 was the Titanic, fully loaded. Three propellers, that matches. Actually, the Titan had more watertight compartments at 19 instead of the 16 the tit Titanic actually had. Number of lifeboats, the Titan actually had four more than the Titanic. It had um, 24 instead of the 20, which is still four more than the 16 required by the law. Number of passengers, actually the passenger capacitor matches almost exactly. Uh, the passengers aboard, the, in the novel, the ship is filled to capacity at 3,000. The Titanic, on its maiden voyage, actually sailed a little light. They couldn't fill all the seats in time. There were some delays. People chose other ways of passage, saving their lives. But in the end, the tit Titanic actually sailed with about 800 less passengers or 700 less passengers than, than it actually could have sailed with. Speed, a little lower than what the uh, Titan was. And uh, in the book, the ship struck the iceberg at near midnight compared to 11.40 p.m. Starboard side, yep. April, yep. Number of survivors, here's where the biggest difference between the book and reality is. There were only 13 survivors in the book, where in real life only 705 and 711. So the Titanic actually worked out better than the book, but I think it's astounding that somebody actually wrote a book, a fictional account, that almost exactly predicted the Titanic. It's one of those quirks of history that you just could not have have predicted and yet here it is. It's actually I think a very strong um, thing to say about fiction writers. Sometimes they get it right, especially when you delve into science fiction. Uh, certainly Jules Verne got a lot of things right too and it partly was due to the fact he did a lot of research and I, I've often wondered uh, whether uh, Morgan Robertson had done a lot of research in, in maritime, ar maritime uh, architecture at the time and, and technology and maybe that's why he got so good at predicting the Titanic. So I'm going to end here with this picture. You notice I haven't shown any pictures of it on the bottom. I wanted to talk more about the Titanic as it was as a ship before the sinking. Almost everybody, of course, has seen these paintings and photographs. Uh, this is uh, Ken Marshall. He did this painting for National Geographic uh, back when the ship was very first explored. And of course, it was nothing like what they found. They thought they would find on the bottom. Uh, for anybody who remembers reading Clive Cussler's book, you know, Raise the Titanic, it was completely intact on the bottom. Uh, all they had to do is pump it dry and patch the hole and it would float just fine. The reality of shipwrecks is very different in the deep ocean than what they originally thought. Uh, of course, the ship is in two pieces. That was a major revelation in its sinking. The uh, ship is in very bad shape for the two pieces that are on the bottom and certainly not going to be refloating it. Also, it's very destructive on the bottom. Um, the, uh, you see a lot of those rust sickles. That's actually bacteria eating the steel at 100 pounds a day. All the organic material is gone. Torito worms ate that uh, lovely staircase, the grand staircase, all the deck planking, benches, chairs, cabinets, everything is gone um, that it's organic on the ship, uh, unless you're very, very deep inside the ship. Uh, so in the end, it's a very different wreck than what people predicted uh, right after it sank, and even all the way up until the 1980s when it was finally discovered. So thank you very much, and uh, I think that's it.